This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Well, good morning, everyone. Just a few quick announcements for you this morning as you're getting settled in. Breck, is this podium mic on? Okay, I'm just, I'm having a hard time hearing myself today. Um, all our typical uh, midweek ministries, uh, all those are on the back of the bulletin. Uh, you can see the times there. The only one that's not included on there is uh, the Wednesday night small group study, uh, Intoxicated by Design. Uh, that is open. If you wanted to, anytime, jump into that uh, study. Wednesday evenings here at the church, 7 p.m. We're working through that. Um, we, got, <clears throat> we got Good Friday service and Easter service coming up here in a couple weeks. As a reminder, on the 31st, there will be no Sunday school that morning. Uh, church service will start at 10 a.m. Uh, that is uh, Easter Sunday. Um, <clears throat> the only other couple announcements I have is uh, this is the last week for signing up for the Biblical Counseling Conference at the early bird price of $35 a person. Uh, next week it goes up to 45 a person on Monday. Uh, if you've got questions regarding what that conference is about, uh, please see me. Uh, the theme this year is biblical peacemaking or conflict resolution. I would highly encourage anybody uh, to sign up for that. That, is, that conference is designed for any person to take part in. Um, from those who are unfamiliar with biblical counseling to those who just want tips and tricks to apply to their own life, uh, it really is uh, on the realm of disciple, uh, discipleship and disciple making. So it applies to every person who shows up. Uh, Jen's Bistro is catering again for lunch. I took my wife there for the first time yesterday, so you can check with her on what the food is like. Um, so it's a good meal. Uh, it'll be a good time. That'll be coming up on May 4th. Uh, the other announcement that I have this morning is... Um, I am looking for volunteers to help facilitate nursery coverage during service. Uh, I've got a couple who have been ongoing on that list. I need to expand that with some additional volunteers. So if you are interested or willing in helping out uh, cover nursery during Sunday service, uh, please come see me. Uh, <clears throat> we do have a speaker in the nursery, so you can still hear service. Um, but we're looking for some more to help facilitate covering that. Is there any announcements that I missed? Doesn't look like it. Good. Uh, please join us for our call to worship. Well, good morning. Everyone, please stand. All right. So we're going to be uh, reading from Psalm 99, 1 through 3. The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion, he is exalted over all peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name, holy is he. Real quick, does anybody have anything, um, maybe a praise that they want to share before we pray this week? I see a lot of faces back uh, that had been out traveling and sick, so I, I think that's a praise. I have a praise. Yep. Um, I had asked at my church about my son who was due to go to the men's health surgery on Tuesday for dinner, and everything went perfectly. Um, the men's health team said it was going to be no trip, so that's a praise. All right. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for um, just our families that are back from traveling, from being ill. Um, it seems to be an unending season now uh, since COVID that uh, just sickness is around, but we're grateful that uh, they're back, that they're here, that they get to gather and worship you. Uh, thank you for the good news and the praise for Debbie's family um, that she shared last week about the 
a possibility of the brain tumor. And uh, Lord, that you're working in that way and for healing. Um, just uh, be with our service today and our pastor. And uh, thank you for being good. And uh, as our responsive reading said this morning, you do reign. Uh, Lord, in your presence, we should be just in awe and, and often just found in a situation where um, if that brings us to trembling, if it brings us to just a place of, wow, you are an awesome God. And uh, just thank you for your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Majesty, worship his majesty.
good morning, everyone, and welcome again to Burr Oak. Uh, if you're visiting for the first time today or viewing this for the first time online, I am Pastor Ben, and it is so good to be with you this morning. If you are visiting for the first time, uh, take a moment, fill out one of our Connect cards. If you're here in person, you can drop it in the plate on the way by during our offering. Uh, online, the uh, best place to find our Connect card is at our website, burroak.org. Uh, regular attendees, you can go there, uh, log into your personal account, mark yourself present for service today. Um, <coughs> there's a lot of stuff you can do through our website. You can submit prayer requests, you can submit uh, questions anonymously that you might have. Uh, <coughs> there's also coming up here, after Easter, we're going to move into a section on spiritual gifts in our adult Sunday school. There's a survey there, uh, an assessment that you can find a link to, to go and uh, take. It's a multiple choice type assessment um, to get an idea of what your spiritual gifts may be. And that will be uh, important for that study we're going to do in our Sunday school after Easter. Well, today uh, we're continuing in our series, No Excuses, the Gospel of John. And last week, we looked at how John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus. And what we saw was that John's ministry was really to pronounce the coming of the long-awaited new covenant. The Lamb of God that John proclaims, he's the mediator of the new covenant, having been the perfect sacrifice and thus fulfilling the old covenant and requiring no more blood sacrifices. He's also the one that gives the promised new heart and new spirit of the new covenant as he is the one that the spirit rests on and is never removed. What we ended with last week is the reminder that Jesus is all we need. That we need to take the time to strip away everything else and just see Jesus for who he is. It is when we see Jesus as more precious than any other thing that we desire that issues in our life begin to work themselves out. For this to happen, though, it means that we need to be willing to bring our deeds and let them be exposed to the light of Christ. So let's go ahead, let's look at our focus first, have our hearts and our minds brought to attention. Go ahead and say this with me. Light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. John 3, 19 through 21. Good, let's go ahead and say it again. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. John 3, 19 through 21. Good. Husbands, please hold the hand of your wife as we pray this morning. Father, you have blessed us with another day, another time to gather together as a small portion of the body of Christ. And so, Father, we ask your blessing on our gathering this morning. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds to be able to receive your word, that, Lord, you would present yourself to us today. For those who are struggling with sorrow, would you present yourself as comfort? For those who are fearful, would you present yourself as the courage they need? For those who are anxious, would you present yourself as the peace that they so long desire? And for those that are harboring sin, would you be the conviction they need that they would be able to find freedom in the light of Christ? Father, we ask your blessing on our message for today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, I don't know if it's just me and my ears, but can you all hear me all right? Does it sound like the mic is on? Okay, good. Good. Well, the title of our message for today is Knowing Jesus, Finding the Messiah. And we're going to be looking at John chapter 1, verses 35 through 51. 
And so if you want to follow along on your device or in your Bible, go ahead and pull that up now. In the Blue Pew Bible, it's on page 982, uh, or you can follow along on the screen. John 1, starting in verse 35. John 1, 35 through 51. Let us hear the word of the Lord. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Well, as we look at knowing Jesus today, there are three points that I want us to consider. We're going to answer further the question, who is Jesus? We're going to look at why we can why we can know Jesus, and we are going to look at what knowing Jesus does for us. Now, as we look at our passage today, there's an interesting thing that takes place. Within these 16 verses, there are seven different terms or phrases used to describe who Jesus is. These seven phrases give us a holistic picture to understanding who Jesus is and answering that question. The first phrase we see in verse 36. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Now we looked at this phrase last week, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time going in depth here, but there's a point of clarification from last week that I want to bring up. Last week we questioned as to which Lamb of God was being described here, the sacrificial lamb or the warrior lamb. What we need to understand is this is not an either-or situation. This is a both-and situation. See, while John the Baptist may have been speaking about Jesus the warrior lamb, John the author, in his post-resurrection understanding, sees both lambs being fulfilled in Jesus. Commenting on this, D.A. Carson states, but this does not necessarily mean that John the evangelist limited himself to this understanding of Lamb of God. It is not that he thought the Baptist wrong. Rather, as a post-resurrection Christian, John could grasp a fuller picture than was possible for the Baptist. John the author, John the evangelist, understood that Jesus was both the needed sacrificial lamb and the anticipated warrior lamb. That term, Lamb of God, is a both and, not an either or. The next term that we see is in verse 38. 
Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher. As John explains here, the term rabbi means teacher. Uh, now, historically, there's an interesting uh, aspect where it wasn't until really the first century that rabbi meant specifically teacher. Until that point, it was just a word, um, a word of respect, a title of respect. Walter Elwell says that uh, <coughs> rabbi meant a title of respect, meaning my great one or my superior one. In the addressing of Jesus as rabbi, we see two confessions. One, that he is perceived by those around him to be someone greater than they are, and two, that he was one capable of instructing those around him. Well, the next phrase that we see is Andrew's confession to his brother in verse 41. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Uh, last week when I mentioned the connection between the Greek and the Hebrew words, uh, how these are parallel words, both meaning the anointed one, uh, this is the one that the Jews had been waiting on. Commenting on this, uh, Borchert states, It was explained by another title, Christ, the designation that became one of the most familiar terms used of Jesus in the Hellenistic world. So familiar had it become that the title was frequently attached to the name of Jesus as a kind of natural double name, Jesus Christ. We are in the habit of using these two terms next to each other that oftentimes it can feel like Jesus Christ is his first and last name. But that's not the case. Christ is not a name, it's a title. Jesus holds the position of the Christ. He holds the position, the title of the anointed one. It's important for us to understand that distinction. The next phrase we see is in verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, to us, for us to properly understand this phrase, we have to have first worked through the prologue as we did and understand that John, the author, establishes that Jesus' true father is Yahweh. Yet, by having this description here, there are a couple things that we can come to know. See, unlike Matthew and Luke's Gospels, John does not bother himself with genealogies. However, by showing here where Jesus came from and the family to which he belonged, John establishes that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. The fully God part is what we can understand from the prologue. This aspect of Jesus being both fully God and fully man is an essential doctrinal truth to the Christian faith. To deny either Jesus' divinity or his humanity is to deny who Jesus really is. It's important for us to know both aspects and know that he fulfilled both aspects. This nature of Jesus is something that has been both denied and debated since some of the earliest days of the Christian faith. The technical term for this phenomenon is the hypostatic union, and that was established in 421, I believe, at the, uh, the Council of Caledonia. This is the understanding that within one person, Jesus was both fully God and fully man. This is not something we can fully understand or relate to any other aspect of our human understanding. And while we struggle to understand how this is possible, Wayne Grudem sums this phenomenon up by saying, It is by far the most amazing miracle of the entire Bible. Far more amazing than the resurrection and more amazing even than the creation of the universe. The fact that the infinite, omnipotent, eternal Son of God could become man and join himself to a human nature forever so that infinite God became one person with finite man, that will remain for eternity the most profound miracle and the most profound mystery in all the universe. This is an aspect of Jesus that we, we need to understand. 
And in John recording uh, Philip's response here, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, it's historical evidence that Jesus was an actual human being, something that is not denied, something that even secular historians have said, yes, the actual person, Jesus of Nazareth, did live. It gives credit to the his historicity of the Bible. The next phrase that we see comes from the middle part of verse 49. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. Now Carson claims that Nathaniel spoke better than he knew, similar to John the Baptist in the phrase, Lamb of God. Nathaniel, in essence, is declaring the oneness of the relationship that Jesus has with Yahweh. Outside of this, John uses this term to again show that Jesus is the long-awaited son that had been described from the Old Testament. He was the one to receive the blessing and the inheritance that were promised. He was the son of promise, the long-awaited offspring that would never lose Yahweh's blessing, the offspring that would crush the head of the serpent. Nathaniel, also in his response, gives us the sixth phrase. You are the king of Israel. This phrase is appropriately connected with the previous one, as both of them were ways of describing the Messiah. However, this one, uh, for the first century Jews, carried with it specifically the idea of political freedom. And while this may have been the short-sighted view of the disciples to begin with, from our post-resurrection perspective, we can see where Jesus is more than the king of Israel, but he is the king of kings. Now the final phrase that we're going to look at comes from our last verse, verse 51. And he said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, in looking at this phrase and seeing these seven phrases pulled out from this passage, uh, there's something that we need to notice. Notice how in the first six, those terms or those phrases were the words that the people around Jesus used to describe him. This last one, this final phrase, is how Jesus decided to describe himself as the Son of Man. Now this title would have drawn the attention of the Israelites to the one that Daniel had prophesied about in Daniel 7, verses 13 through 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. The promised son of man was one who would not only liberate Israel, but liberate the entire world. In commenting on this, Carson states, Titles like the King of Israel and the King of the Jews, while appropriate at certain level, were so loaded with political messiism that they could not be adopted without restraint and appropriate caveats. Son of Man, on the other hand, lay ready at hand as an expression that could be filled with precisely the right content. In Jesus' self-designation as the Son of Man, he informs the listener that he is more than what they believe him to be, that he is the one sent from Yahweh to establish the everlasting kingdom. And what we will see him do from here through the rest of this gospel is what it looks like to live within that kingdom. And the very next thing we see him do is begin to call the citizens of that kingdom. And then with this, we can come to know Jesus because he first knows us. Now our text two sections, our next two sections are going to show us what takes place as Jesus begins to interact with those around him. The first thing we are going to look at is how we can come to know Jesus, and that being because he does first know us. Let's look back to verse 42. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. 
you shall be called Kephas, which means Peter. You know, Peter is an interesting person to do a case study on. The sense that we get from reading the Gospels and the book of Acts is that Peter was someone who met things with an initial skepticism and bullheadedness. He comes across as someone who needs evidence for his mind to be changed and probably just assumes that he is right in his understanding of life around him. Maybe some of you can relate. Well, I'm not going to go fully into Peter's story. It is worth noting that these fallen characteristics of his, we can still see evident even after Jesus ascended to heaven. We know this from the account in the book of Acts of the Jerusalem Council. Uh, that meeting, the Jerusalem Council, took place approximately 15 years after Jesus' ascension, and the topic of debate at that council was whether or not Gentiles needed to convert to Judaism before becoming Christians, specifically needing to be circumcised to show that they are Christian. Uh, the two major debaters were Peter and Paul. They were on opposite sides. Peter argued that Gentiles needed to be circumcised, while Paul argued that they did not. What we can understand from this is that even after walking with Jesus for nearly 20 years and ministering people, there was still room for personal growth. But what we see here is that the completion of growth was not necessary to begin down a new path. John presents that at the outset of the adventure with Jesus, Simon's name was changed. Commenting on this, Carson goes on to state, when Peter is brought to him, Jesus assigns a new name as a declaration of what Peter will become. And clarifying what is happening here, Carson continues, it says, here in John 1, however, the focus is much less on what this name change means for Peter than on the Jesus who knows people thoroughly and not only sees into them, but so calls them that he makes them what he calls them to be. See, while John is describing Peter's name change, the focus isn't on Peter. The focus is on Jesus, who has the ability to see what he can make Peter become. Peter can't become the rock that Jesus calls him to be on his own. He only becomes that way through walking with Christ and allowing Christ to do a work in his life. And as we move into the next exchange, we see Jesus' ability to know us presented in another way. Look at verses 46 through 48. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. To begin uh, by helping us understand Nathanael's response, Colin Cruz comments saying, Nazareth was such an insignificant place and one that appears in none of the prophecies concerning the Messiah. So Nathaniel was not willing to accept Philip's testimony. See, Nathaniel wasn't entirely out of line culturally with his response. Him wondering if anything good could come out of Nazareth, that was stating a fact that was understood by the people of that time. And his straightforward response gives us a glimpse into the character of his heart. Jesus, however, has a more complete view, and we see this from his response in verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Going further, Jesus informs Nathanael that he also knew what he was doing before Philip extended the invitation to him. And from these two exchanges, there are three things that we can learn about Jesus knowing us. First, Jesus knows the character of your heart. 
Now, there is a phrase out there amongst Christians when they are trying to excuse away a sinful behavior where they'll say, Jesus knows my heart. That ought to scare you. Scripture is very clear that man's heart is wicked beyond our knowing. Jesus knowing your heart is a terrifying thing. It doesn't mean that he knows that I have good intentions. No. He knows your heart better than you. Your heart is evil. Your heart is wicked. It is sick beyond help. The only one who can change it is Jesus. Jesus knows the character of your heart. Jesus also knows the specifics of your situations. He knows what you're going through. He knows how you're tempted, how you're tested. He knows when you're going to fail. He knows when you are going to excel. He knows what's coming down the line before you even have a hint of it on your radar. He knows your heart. He knows your situation. And he knows what he can make you to be. He knows despite the wickedness of your heart, he knows despite the hardships of the situations that you'll be in, he knows how to take all that and use it for your good, causing you to grow in his likeness. He knows you fully. And this knowing you fully is the pathway to you coming to know him. I want you to think back to when you had a coach or a teacher, uh, a parent, an adult, some type of role model in your life, some type of mentor in your life that was able to see your potential even when you could not. Because of how they knew you, there was a level of trust that you had in them when they encouraged you to move beyond where you were comfortable. Jesus is demonstrating here that he already has that knowledge. And by him knowing us in a very personal and intimate way, he invites us to come to know him. He knows every little aspect about you, even the stuff you hide from the people closest to you. And yet he still extends the invitation for you to come and see. And our passage here gives us a glimpse into why this happens. As we look at this exchange with Nathaniel, our minds ought to run to a connection to the Old Testament. Verse 51 gives us some insight. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This picture of the angels of God ascending and descending should remind us of another familiar story. That story comes out of Genesis chapter 28. We read in verse 12, and he dreamed, this is talking about Jacob, and he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. It was out of this vision that Jacob went to name that place Bethel, the house of God, and to proclaim that it was the gateway to heaven. Verse 17. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Coming back to the Gospel of John, and Jesus' exchange with Nathaniel, Jesus is showing that the true Bethel, the true house of God, has now come. Jesus, the true house of God, the true gate to heaven, the one that knows every aspect about every person, has now come. And in his knowing us, we can now obtain what John proclaims in his prologue in verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God.
And when we come to know him, it ought to produce something within us. There is something that ought to happen. Knowing Jesus causes us to invite others. And the couple times so far in this series that we have looked at John the Baptist, we have discussed the necessity of testifying. We see the fruition of that point in our passage today. We're going to start back in verse 35. It says, the next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. First of all, we ought to notice that John has a platform. He has following. And John, he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Jumping up to verse 40, we read, One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. John, the author, is showing the spread of this message. At the time of writing this gospel, Peter was already well known in the church. Peter had been martyred about 30 years prior to John's gospel being written. The gospel of Mark, which was based on Peter's preaching and testimony, was already being circulated. And Peter's two letters were already well known within the church as well. Peter was a prominent figure. John here in saying Andrew, Simon's Peter brother, is making a connection for the early reader. Andrew was first introduced to Jesus by John the Baptist. And Andrew took what he had seen and heard to his brother. Verse 41. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. You know, when it comes to evangelism, we tend to overlook the most foundational aspect to it. Personal relationship. Commenting on this verse, Carson states, talking about Andrew, he says, He thus became the first in a long line of successors who have discovered that the most common and effective Christian, Christian testimony is the private witness of friend to friend, brother to brother. John presents to the reader of his gospel that the most effective mode of evangelism was personal relationship. And that for those who have come to know Jesus, they were then motivated to go to others and invite them to come and see. Look at verses 45 and 46. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Now, Philip was from the same town as Andrew and Peter. And him accepting the call to follow me from Jesus, he goes to his friend Nathanael. And despite Nathanael's honest skepticism, Philip invites him to come and see Jesus anyway. Philip and Andrew, both having answered the call to come and see and to follow me, both in turn have the same reaction, to then go and invite someone else. But it was the thing, or rather the whom, they were extending the invitation to come and see that we need to notice. See, this is where we get stuck in our culture when it comes to inviting others to church. We judge our church based on our preferences. And if it's not meeting our preferences, then we are less likely to invite someone. Yet the invitation is never to the church. The invitation is to come and see Jesus. If a church is showing Jesus then that is all that matters. Kenneth Gangle shares that the main idea of this message from John, this passage from John, is that it is important for us to remember that people come to Christ through us, not by us, and certainly not to us. This is the principle for evangelism. People come to Jesus through us. 
by us telling of the wonderful things that he has accomplished in our lives when we made him Lord over it, by us extending the invitation to come and see, by us living differently as a result of following Jesus, we are simply an avenue that the agent of Yahweh works through. That agent is the Holy Spirit. Nobody can come to know Jesus by us. They come to know that only through the revelation that the Spirit gives them. And finally, we do not call them to us. It is about Jesus and Jesus alone. That invitation we extend should only be to come and see Jesus, the Messiah that we have found. Not the programs that we like, not the music we prefer, not the messages or the pastor, and not the church. The invitation that we send is to come and meet Jesus. And if the church is doing what it's supposed to, then Jesus will be present even if our personal preferences are not. Now, as we close today, as we close, I just want to say that I know church can be hard. Church requires us to humble ourselves and to trust imperfect leaders that the Holy Spirit has put in place. Oftentimes, this can lead to feelings being hurt, this can lead to misunderstandings. This can lead to individuals being hurt and wondering why certain things have happened or have not happened. Now this goes on long enough, not being checked, not being corrected, and what I call a spiritual vacuum can take place. A spiritual vacuum is a church that has a select number of people showing up week after week to serve, to create a certain atmosphere. Well, the majority of people sit back and are just consumers. When this situation goes unchecked, it can lead to burnout, which leads to individuals church hopping because they can never find what they are looking for. They are hesitant to get involved in other churches because they do not want to be hurt again, and they do not want to run the chance of being burnt out again. But I'm going to be honest with you with what lies at the bottom of that, what lies at the bottom of burnout, what lies at the bottom of church hopping, what lies at the bottom of those hurt feelings. It is an idol in our heart that says we know how church ought to be run, that our preferences are the correct perspective on how things should be done. And if I am not listened to, meaning my ideas are not incorporated, then I must not be seen as valuable, and therefore I need to find another church. The issue is, is you will take those same idols with you to another church. We were told in seminary that there is no such thing as a perfect church, and if there is, the moment you walk in the door, it has now become imperfect. We are all sinners in need of grace. And if we all are trying to grow in the image of Christ and wanting to honor and glorify him with our lives, then we can make church work, and it can be a wonderfully glorious thing. When we keep the perspective that it's not about us, it's about Jesus. See, at the heart of the issue is us trying to make the church in our image when the church is supposed to be growing in the image of Christ, growing in maturity to the full stature of Christ. Church is about Jesus and Jesus alone. And our task is simply to follow him and to invite others to come and see. Father, we thank you for another day where we get to come together. Father, ignite in us the flame to cause us to invite others to just come and see. 
Help us to see those things that are keeping us from being able to really follow you, that prevent us from inviting others to come and see. Father, may we continue to seek to glorify your name and your name alone. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Father, you have again blessed us with another day. Let us not take it for granted. Let us find reason this day to praise your name despite what's going on in our lives. Father, we come before you this morning repenting of our sins. Father, we fail. We fail all the time. We fail in thought. We fail in deed. We don't live in the way that you've called us to. We live for ourselves. We become selfish. And that's never honoring to you. So, Father, forgive us of our shortcomings. Forgive us of our sins. Give us the strength to be able to turn and walk away from them to a life that honors and glorifies you. Father, we are thankful that when we are faithful to repent, that you are faithful to forgive us of our sin. Remembering them no more, not holding us accountable for them no more, but covering us with the blood of Christ. Father, let us again praise your name. Let us praise your name as, as we take in the fact of forgiveness. As we get to just experience that free gift of grace, let us rejoice. Father, encourage us Encourage us to extend that invitation to others to come and see. And Father, if we're, if we're not at the point yet to where we can't invite somebody, encourage us to pray for them. Pray on their behalf. There are needs, Lord, for people all around us. There are needs for members of this church. There are needs for members of our community. There's needs for members of our family. Lord, we are not without supply for our prayer lives. Encourage us, Lord, to come to you with all of these needs. As Paul says in Ephesians 3, come to you who can do far beyond what we can imagine. <clears throat> Father, we continue to pray for the ministries of our area. For Noble House, for Inspiration Ministries, LifeWise Academy, Miracle Tree, Gateway Woods, Father, and many, many more. Provide them with what they need. And if what they're in need of is volunteers, then encourage us to volunteer. Encourage us to give of our time for the benefit of someone else. Father, we continue to lift up our missionaries. Bless them in their endeavors. Father, we continue to pray for the other churches of our area. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. May they stand on your word and be fruitful in their endeavors. May we find ways to work hand in hand with them. Father, continue to be with our local schools. Keep the kids safe during their days of study. Provide for the teachers all they need to be accomplished their tasks. Show us ways, Lord, that we can partner with the local school systems. Where we can go as your children into these areas and, and love on people. And love our community. Father, as we sit and we look at all these needs and we wonder what we can do, again, encourage us to prayer. But if you've given us the means to act and we feel you prompting us to move, 
Lord, encourage us not to drag our feet. Encourage us to lay down our own lives as you did for us, as you have set the example so that we may show love to those around us. And those things that are within our heart that causes us to hesitate, to question, to not be sure, to almost be like Gideon throwing the fleece out. Show us what those idols are, Lord. Bring us to a point of repentance of them. And then lead us in the ways to, to be able to honor and glorify your name. Father, you have blessed us with so much. And today you gave us the opportunity to give some back. And Lord, we ask your blessing on the gift and the giver. We ask that as an organization that we would be good stewards of what you have given us. That we would use it to extend your kingdom, to glorify your name. Father, we are so thankful for what you have given us. And Lord, as we have been getting excited about some future opportunities and, and looking at things we can do and seeing areas that you are moving in, Lord, we pray and ask that you would bring us everything we need. Bring us the vision, bring us the finances, bring us the people. Let us trust you with every aspect, Lord. Father, may we continue to seek to honor and glorify your name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. the throne of glory nothing in my hands I bring but the promise of acceptance from a good and gracious King I will give to you my you give to me your strength. Come and fill me with your spirit as I sing to you this praise. You deserve the greater glory. Overcome I lift my you would see as your child and as your